Good morning, South Bay Church. Steve Marici here from the Marici Studios on this Sunday morning. Super excited to uh, be able to get this out to everybody as we get together in our small groups by House Church and uh, take the opportunity to get into God's Word, take communion together, and just really get focused on Christ and our relationship with Him as we head into the new week. A um, couple of announcements before I get started uh, on May uh, actually, a week from Sunday, a week from today, we will have our Mother's Day service. So uh, please come on out to that. We'll have some additional announcements with that as well. But we take the opportunity. Um, the kids will have their videos that will be put together to uh, encourage the moms. For those of you that are procuring that information, please get it to Rhett Butler as quickly as you can. And uh, if we can try to avoid Sunday morning, uh, I think the cutoff date for him would be the Wednesday going into that week, which would make his life and his family's life a lot easier. So if you could facilitate that, that would be great. Uh, May 19th, uh, we will be celebrating as a church as Rhett Martini uh, Butler are appointed. Uh, Rhett will be appointed evangelist, Martini women's ministry leader. And we have our, uh, with, that is actually a regional service, so please mark that down. That'll be at Miracosta High School. And uh, just a final reminder on special missions as well. June is the month uh, that we take up our missions contribution for the Middle East, the Mexico and Central America, as well as our Baltic and Nordic uh, Missions Association. I know many of you are, uh, have, are close to having completed that and that you've been giving weekly or monthly or knowing that it's set up electronically for the rest. I just want to encourage you. Uh, the multiple for that is an eight time multiple, basically eight times our weekly uh, is the dollar amount we've committed to for our mission societies. And obviously that makes their work a joy, gives them facilities to meet in, uh, staffing in most situations, and uh, just really an opportunity for them to have an am amazing impact within their local communities. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, go to the message. Open up with a word of prayer here. Father, I just wanna thank you for what an amazing God you are, uh, thinking through my own personal sinful nature and the way my sins are forgiven and the fact that with the grace that's been extended through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that took place at the cross, but ultimately uh, culminating in his resurrection, knowing that he'll be coming back again someday. Uh, just grateful that I can have this relationship with you, uh, knowing what my life looked like before I became a Christian and the transformation that took place after coming out of the waters of baptism. I know that's something as disciples, uh, your followers, your image bearers, we are all incredibly grateful for. So this morning, as we look to your word, I pray that you uh, work through me in a great way, uh, that the Holy Spirit speaks, and that with that, we can continue to grow and mature in our relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, uh, the uh, title of the message this morning is Response to the Resurrection, and uh, we've had a, a few opportunities to take a look at that. Uh, Easter, a little over a month ago, and then uh, Rhett did a follow-up to that, uh, entitled, I believe it was The uh, Road to Emos. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of pick up there this morning. I just feel like uh, the resurrection is an area that we really need to spend uh, much more time in thought in mind, um, just really understanding the significance of it and the transformation that takes place through it. At the cross, we know that Jesus bore our sins. He was that sin offering for us and that sacrifice that God's so willingly sending his son to die for us gives us the ability to have a relationship with him. We do spend an, 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 just a large amount of time on the cross. But the real significant point for us as Christians is the resurrection, the time in between when Jesus rose from the dead to our own resurrection through the waters of baptism, and that's incredibly significant. So as we're thinking about that today, we've seen the, the reality and the relevance of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, but really thinking through it, we have to grasp these things in the simplest terms and really get down to asking ourselves, what should we do in response to this amazing news? Uh, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And with that, I thought it would be good to just kind of take a look at the response of the first century uh, Christians, in particular, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, coming out of uh, the book of John in chapter 20, and that their response, thinking it through with these three individuals, when they heard about it, they ran. And with the discovery that Mary had, she ran to let the disciples know what was going on after she had been to the tomb. So let's go ahead and start in John 20, uh, verse 1. 
if you'll look there with me, open your Bibles or scroll through on your phones. In John 20, verse 1, it reads, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, kind of like how John refers to him as such. He never uses his name. But uh, anyway, so uh, they ran to the tomb. And uh, I, I think just really understanding this, they ran to see themselves what had gone on. It says they had, Mary had uh, conveyed that they had taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and John ran for themselves to see what was going on. And in that excitement and confusion, just really understanding this is a major deal. And that's why I think when the Bible tells us they ran. They, they couldn't believe. And there, with that, there was a lot of confusion and excitement and probably some fear as to why that tomb was empty. But um, both were running. Uh, John mentions himself having outrun Peter as he reached the tomb first. And, you know, I think with this, they weren't entirely sure what to make of, of the fact that Jesus was missing. And we see John going into some detail about the investigation that he and Peter undertook. They leaned into the tomb. They, they took a look around. They saw the burial garments of Jesus lying there in the tomb, but no Jesus. And in verse 9, it says, Mary joined them, but none of them really knew what was going on. Uh, in verse 9, it says, they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So when Mary got back, apparently she wasn't as fast as Peter and John, uh, but at the point in time that she got there, she broke out in tears. In verse 11, it says that Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over and looked into the tomb. And again, yeah, I, I think there's probably this mixture of fear. Um, some of them, I, I, this is me thinking back to the message they received. It may have been a matter of fear and hope. They knew that Jesus had stated that he was going to come back, and that he would rise from the dead. But even with that, Mary couldn't hold back the tears. Not only was Mary sad, she was also confused. And while she was at the empty tomb, Jesus appeared before her in his glorified body. And she didn't even recognize him at this point. She mistook him as the gardener, as we see in verse 15. She says, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will go get him. And at this point, Mary holds, Jesus says her name. Uh, it wasn't until that point that she really recognized him. And it goes on to say that Mary held on to Jesus. So once she heard her name, she, she recognized this was Jesus. She threw her arms around him and she was filled with joy and wonder as she interacted with him at this point. It goes on, Mary proclaimed the good news to the rest of the disciples. And at Jesus' command, Mary left Jesus and went back to the others to let them know in verse 18, it says, I have seen the Lord. So the disciples are dealing with confusion. They're, they're, they're scared, uh, knowing that the death that Jesus went to on that cross. I'm sure some of them are thinking these are the repercussions they might even have for their own life based on what had taken place up to this point. So the disciples start to get warmed up here a little bit. They start to gradually amp it up a little bit from being distraught. And we see that they transition to being glad after Mary informed them she had talked to Jesus. And then they're, they're in this upper room. It's locked up. Again, I, a lot of fear um, is involved with this. And then it said, Jesus just kind of appeared in the room. He came up and he stood among them and he said to them, peace be with you. And as John recounts this interaction, he gives the impression that it took a bit for the disciples to make sense of what they were seeing, but eventually the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord in verse 20. So while 10 of them were relatively quickly won over, one of them was still pretty critical about what was going on. And most of us are familiar with Thomas uh, in verse 25. Thomas says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. Eventually, however, Thomas believed when Jesus finally appeared to him and allowed Thomas to see his scars. Thomas answers at this point, my Lord and my God. So just thinking through all the activity that's taking place here, the point of all of this isn't necessarily for us to run or investigate or weep or doubt of any of these things, but John simply tells us what the disciples did, not necessarily what they should have done, and the point here is that the empty tomb necessitates that we do something. So 
Perhaps you've noticed that even though the disciples still didn't fully grasp its significance, and really wouldn't until the Spirit actually indwelled in them, they understood enough to know that the resurrection necessitated a response beyond the ordinary. And I think for us as disciples, really needing to understand that I think we, we the, the further removed from our baptism we get, I, I think in some ways it just kind of becomes something that's kind of a normalized situation. And getting back to the awe that we had when we came to the understanding what would happen when we were baptized and the awe that we had coming out of the waters of baptism, knowing that our sins were forgiven, and beyond that, that we'd actually receive the Holy Spirit, it's anything but normal. It's not even close to being a normal event. And so with that, it requires anything but a normal response. So to read the gospel accounts of the responses, I think for us, as we look at it, is to feel the disciples' urgency, amazement, confusion, desperation, hope, and all. You know, and in a lot of ways, haven't we all had these things, these emotions, these feelings at different times in our life? You know, I can, I can think back to uh, the, the point in time early on in my life where uh, I was agnostic uh, from the age of 13 to 32, and there were those nights, there weren't a lot of them, but there were these nights where I'd sit up at night just, you know, being fearful. One, I hadn't accomplished a whole lot at that point in time, uh, my teens and my early 20s. And this, this just waking up sometimes at night thinking, man, when this is all said and done, I, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to die and I'm going to go into nothingness. And I remember just weeping on a number of occasions and, you know, this, this, this degree of confusion and fear and then looking back at different aspects of my life, when my son was first born, uh, he was my first biological relative being adopted. And I'll never forget his birth. I'll never forget holding him. Uh, the tears that I shed, uh, just sitting there looking at this amazing baby in to total awe and understanding at that point in time, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something else. And that's when the scales, I think, started to fall from my eyes. My heart started to soften up. Uh, so in going from confusion and desperation to amazement at his birth, amazement at my daughter's birth, uh, hope for the future when it came to my marriage. And this was after becoming a baptized disciple, really feeling like I could work through a lot of the damage that I'd done in my marriage and the relationship with my kids. So being very hopeful. And then just in general, seeing people come to the faith, seeing marriages saved, seeing uh, children become Christians. And, and, and with that, uh, just understanding how that can look. I mean, there are times where our kids are doing amazing and there's times where maybe they're not doing so great. Maybe you've got multiple kids and they're all in different places at the, at the same time. But really understanding after the, because of the resurrection of Christ, there are going to still be times in our life where there is amazement, confusion, desperation, hope, and all, but that's okay because we know that death doesn't have its hold on us. So until you've felt those things with them as the disciples did, you know, maybe you're still searching for the true meaning of the resurrection. And as we consider our proper response to the resurrection, we've got to pray that God would help us make sure it's in proper proportion to the significance of the resurrection. You know, just even thinking back through when I was going through uh, the studies uh, on, you know, the word, the significance of the word, what, what it means to be a disciple, some of these different things, um, a lot of different emotions were felt through that. But I think the biggest one for me, understanding that I wanted to become a Christian, that I wasn't a Christian, the hope that was associated with that. You know, and again, a lot of those same emotions that we're talking about that the disciples went through. I remember driving to my baptism, you know, it probably was the, the best driving that had ever taken place in my life because I wanted to get there in one piece, understanding that I wasn't right with God yet. And coming out of the waters of baptism, understanding that this was the beginning of a new life for me. There was a transformation that was associated with this, just as there was for Jesus as he was transformed back to life, coming out of the tomb and appearing to the disciples and give, sharing with them this hope about what their lives could look like walking with Christ. So with that, just thinking about this for a minute, how then should we respond to the resurrection today? 
I mean, that's the great call of the Christian life. Every one of us is living between resurrections, Jesus and ours. And I just wanted to close things out this morning with a few different things that we might want to consider as to our response to the resurrection. How do we respond to all of this? You know, I think the first one is prayer. And I'm really gr grateful for Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which we've gone through last year. Uh, silence and solitude, just really slowing down and disconnecting from all the crazy and chaos that goes around us so we can focus on what truly is significant this, in this life. So praying for true understanding and appreciating and responding to the resurrection, you know, understanding what an amazing gift from God that is. To pray earnestly and to ask God to fill each of us with a real understanding of what happened and what it means. And then asking God to fill us with the appropriate awe and wonder about what took place at, Cal at Calvary 2,000 years ago, but more importantly, what happened at that tomb. The resurrection, the life of Christ coming out of that and the impact that it's had on people to this day. So asking God, too, to, to fill us with this kind of focus and courage that only the resurrection can provide, understanding that we are resurrected through those waters of baptism. We share that with Jesus, as we see in uh, Paul talking about in Romans 6. So really, again, asking God to fill us with this kind of focus and courage that the resurrection does provide and can provide if we continue to have that kind of focus and awareness. Ask him to give us the kind of love that he showed to each one of us by sending Jesus not just to die for us, but to rise for us. You know, and as we've been going through emotionally healthy relationships, making sure that we understand our relationship with God is the most important relationship of all of them. You know, we, we've talked a lot about Matthew 22 and that you need to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And those are the two greatest commandments. And with that understanding, how significant that is for us in light of emotionally healthy relationships, it's got to start with our relationship with God first. And then those other areas of our lives when it comes to our marriage or relationships, our children, nieces, nephews, aunties, grandmas, grandpas, whatever it may be, our neighbors, that we can be what God has called us to be if we're focused on him first. You know, the whole Bible and the, the New Testament transition from prayer to reading God's word. Uh, it just, again, it demonstrates for us the kind of love that God showed each of us sending Jesus to die for us. But when it comes to emotionally healthy relationships, understanding our relationship with God, again, first and foremost, the whole Bible and the New Testament in particular is primarily a description of the way God wants us to respond to the good news, to the gospel, the, the whole aspect of what he demonstrated for us in this covenant that he entered into us by sending his son to die for us, but most importantly, the resurrection of Jesus. It's not up to us to decide how God wants us to live in light of the resurrection. It's, it is not up to us to decide the proper response. God has graciously told us all he requires of us. A right response to the resurrection means reading the Bible, connecting with God through that lens of the resurrection. And with that, let me encourage you to commit to prayerfully scouring the Bible. And there's so many resources at our fingertips today, whether it be the Bible Project or Marty Solomon or some of the, the, the late greats, uh, uh, various authors that are out there, C.S. Lewis, whatever the resources that you use for yourself and with others. But you got to use them. God's given us all these amazing tools for, and really understanding all of these things are used to help us describe this amazing gift we've had through the resurrection and understanding the wake and the power of the resurrection. And then with the Spirit's help, live like that, be like that, be that image bearer of Christ. So we need to pray. We need to read. We need to praise. You know, that's what I love about our corporate uh, worship when we come together, uh, being able to sing together. And it, it's, it's so amazing to me, as crazy as the world is, that one of the areas that people unite with is with music. Whether it's secular music or Christian music, music moves the heart. It, it never ceases to amaze me 
how some songs can give you chills. Other songs can bring you to tears. Um, there's a song by James Blunt called Monsters, and it's, it's a song talking about this son and his dad being at this transition in life. And there's a line in it that, that states, um, you know, we're not father and son, we're just two men. And, and walking through just this idea of forgiveness and being there to encourage one another is, as his father will pass eventually. And this is the power of music, but it transitions into this amazing aspect of praise. So we, we need to praise God. Above all, we, we need to consider all the Bible says about the reality, revelance, and the right response of the resurrection. And praising God is, is the biggest one out of all of it, to worship God, to praise him in the highest. He deserves all glory and praise. And there are a few places that we see that more clearly other than the resurrection. So praise him in prayer, music, art, obedience, time in nature, whatever it is that helps you connect and have that degree of awe. And as God grants you genuine awe at the empty tomb, turn back to God and worship. And I think with all of that, having all of that and that understanding of it all, you know, I, I know there are instances where we feel the prodding of the Spirit, but we have a hard time relating what that looks like to other people, knowing the struggles that we were in or going through before we became Christians. And some of you, there may not have been much, but we all know what life was like before. And I, I believe by reading our Bible, by praying and praising God, we won't be in a position where we can keep the good news to ourselves. So don't keep the good news to yourself. Tell someone today and tomorrow and until Jesus returns. You know, there's so much more to life than any athletic victory or academic reward or a financial windfall or a work promotion or physical healing or any other good news. Share the greatest news with the greatest urgency and joy with the whole world. And then finally, live with focus confidence. The reality and the relevance of the resurrection, more than anything else, fixes our eyes on things that truly matter and fills us with confidence that victory from this life in this life is certain. Why? Because death is dead. We have perfect purpose and reason to love God and our neighbors and to glorify God by bringing men and women into our church community where we can help them make Jesus Lord through our example, the scriptures and our love. So because death is dead, we have this Perfect confidence that to live is Christ and to die is gain, as Paul has said. This enables us to live in gladness and freedom and love and hope, regardless of the circumstances or how others respond. So just getting back to Easter, we have this amazing focus as we go into that day. But this is a focus we need to have every day. Easter was a reminder that we are never accepted by God because of what we have done, just as we are never acceptable to God because of what we do. You can't get your resurrection and response dialed in enough to really earn God's favor. We need to understand that it's a gift. It's through grace. Instead, the resurrection is an eternal de declaration that Jesus did for us what God requires of us. While we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Jesus lived in perfect obedience, died in our place, and then rose from the dead to give us everlasting life. That's the power of the resurrection. We gain access to that, not by our works or our flesh. Our flesh is of, of no use in this area at all, but by trusting that Jesus alone is sufficient. Jesus is enough. And his resurrection from the dead declares that in power, we've seen it as he rose from the tomb. And we look at the impact that he had after he came back as he promised, as God promised he would. So I want to close in uh, the, the words of the restored Peter in 1 Peter 3, verse 1. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is revealed to us in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, 
You may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth and gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So what I'd, I'd like you to do this morning is to, to take a moment just to reflect on how amazing the resurrection is. And whether you're at home with your family or you're participating in a small group house church, uh, take the time to reflect on that and uh, have someone in the house church lead you in a prayer before you take the communion this morning. God bless. I'm so grateful for where the boundaries have landed for us here in the South Bay Church and so grateful for each and every one of you that are part of our community. Much love for the Marichis. God bless. Thank you.